hard to use it to speak, uh, I like standing like this, but let's try. Mm? Um, I don't think I can be so poetic and with such a liter literary ins inspiration as my former colleagues, but um, at least I have a quote to begin. Uh, as above, so below. This is an ancient uh, alchemic saying from Paracelsus, I think. You know, uh, it has been transformed over the centuries. But I wanted to keep this in mind because uh, what I would like to, sh to share with you now, uh, and this stems from what I heard since this morning, is to put climate issue in a perspective. You know? Carbon and land, as above, so below. You know? We are under the overarching narrative of climate change. This is no doubt about it. This is the most mobilizing issues of our times, as it's very in fashion to say. And you, especially in New York, are very impacted by the big march you just had. But we in Latin America, we have been struggling uh, with the entire climate framework for quite a while. I specifically, I followed the negotiations very closely since 2008 as a representative of civil society networks. And we have a very strong critique to how far the whole climate issue is, is utile, you say utile? To the reproduction of capitalism in the 21st century. First, I just made a list here to, for us to start this conversation. It's a hyper-reductionist narrative. For everybody that works with the ecology and ecosystems, it's very dangerous to talk about mono-causality because we know the complexity of the systems. But it's very utile to have one overarching narrative that can be equivalent to all. In this sense, we are accepting within the force that the whole climate issue has been uh, uh, I would not say impose it, but has been, you know, pushed forward. Uh, we are helping to create an intangible asset. As you know, a carbon equivalent, a unity of CO2 equivalent uh, reduction of uh, greenhouse gases has a price in the market. You actually have created in the United States, and if I'm not mistaken, the Obama family is on board, the so-called Chicago Climate Exchange where you can trade those papers on a voluntary basis. But you have the European Union emission trade schemes, which now I think 29 countries are part of it. And although we criticize it as a market, it's the largest climate public policy that we have in the world. Those are just to start with the contradictions, no? So the World Bank, and this you can Google after, the vice president of the World Bank made a very good speech two years ago saying that the carbon is the currency and will be the currency of the 21st century. And she made a comparison with what was the gold standard within the Bretton Woods agreements and how we had the dollar hegemony after the World War II. For those who follow the debates on the G20, there is a big issue with the, the exchange rates and the, what they call the basket of currencies, no? and how we, we equalize global trade. Uh, of course, the BRICS countries are pushing forward a more equitative representativeness in this virtualized and fictitious basket of, of currency. And so carbon would fit very well. Of course, this is not something that is going to happen right away. You know, this is a project. It's a mid-long-term project to kind of create this equivalency. We have uh, the largest corporations on earth pushing forward, put a price on carbon. Put a price on carbon. This is in, embedded into a larger process that we call the financialization of nature. You probably heard about the wonders of natural capital, and I want to talk more about that in a little while. 
So to have carbon as a currency, we need a ballast. Do you understand ballast? If I say, like if you have a ship that comes to, to pick up goods and it's empty, it needs all the water, that's the ballast water, so you arrive in the port and then you empty that water that usually comes with invasive species. <laughs> in our case in Brazil, we have a lot. And then you can fill that with commodities and send it out. So the ballast for the whole carbon discourse is being land. If you track back all the very uh, creative mechanisms that have been created under the climate convention to the CDM, the so-called RED, reduction emissions from deforestation and then degradation. Now the whole talk about climate smart agriculture and so on and so on. At, of course they are created to be traded in financial markets because they are all papers, no? But at some point they need a ballast. They are inscripted in a project in a territory where there are people living in and there were very strategic resources. I've worked for the last eight years in the Amazon, so I could stay here maybe days telling you stories of what's happening over there. You know? But uh, I will remind you of uh, a very interesting moment of our history. You know? Uh, the creation of the metric system. No? I, I don't know if you have this as a part of the curriculum in the school here. I don't think so because you don't use the metric system. No? <laughs> but the metric system was an invention. I mean, it was an expedition, La Condamine. It was a project by the French Empire that were sent to measure all the dimensions of the globe. But they went to Ecuador, where they have the point zero, to create uh, standards, weights, and measures that were essentially a colonial project to facilitate trade. Why that? Because people all over the world, they have traded, they have had local markets always, but the point is, when you go to those local markets, you exchange, for instance, in the Amazon, a basket of nuts for a roll of uh, animal skin or a ball of rubber from the rubber tappers. You have shells, you have the um, cask of the cashew, the, um, the Brazil nut, that is also used as a measure. It's not something that is uh, standard, because it's just you, that you use these devices, maybe it's a little bag that they weave and has more or less the same size to contain the things that you are changing, exchanging, if they are loose pieces, and to create the justice in exchange. And those are very old cultural practices that equates in their mind. So when you, when you are talking about international trade, you need standards and measures. That's number one. So the kilo, when they brought the kilo to Brazil, it was a piece of steel, like this size, that you place in the old-fashioned uh, scales. Now, now it's all digital, but at the same time. So the local people that would bring their, their things to exchange, they would not understand what that was all about because they were expecting to exchange for something else. But there was something that was introduced and they were told to believe that that piece of metal had one kilo. And that one kilo of an abstraction, you know, that was one cent, uh, I mean, a hundred parts of blah, blah, blah. You know, I will not go here in the definition of the metric system. Uh, they needed to believe that because in Paris, in the museum, there is a meter you know, that was related to the kilo and that gave all this uniformity to the markets all over. Emblematically, neither the UK nor the USA up today use the metric system. The first and the former empire, no? Uh, and this is quite interesting because what we tackle with the carbon discourse, and it's a new metric that is being imposed everywhere. If you go to the most remote places in Latin America, in Southeast Asia, there have 
uh, armies of consultants, of people that work for development agencies. Somebody quoted here US, USAID, USAID, no? USAID, yeah. <laughs> oh my God, you know? And they have skilled, very skilled, even young people with tattoos, with some kind of you know, visual that it's not the former or the usual suspect that teaches them that that tree that they have their ancestors buried there, five, uh, that they believe there is a spirit living in. No, 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 it's all wrong. That's natural capital, that is a carbon asset. It can be traded and they can teach how. So if you look at uh, the publications on carbon in the local communities or in the indigenous people, there is an iconic picture which is a metric, uh, is it a meter? Metric, no? And they, are, they have to measure at chest high to see the diameter of the tree and they, they divide by half and that's the equivalent of what there is there in carbon. You wouldn't believe how this, in a few years, has drastically changed the relationship that those local communities are having with nature. So we are talking this morning about violence, non-violence, and what about symbolic violence? What about you imposing a, li a life-sized, life how do you say life-sized, no, no, non-spiritual, like, no? Uh, a, a vision that is completely materialistic. So that's, that's what we are doing currently, you know? But most of all, to be able to trade carbon as a global asset, you need to create a new class of, this is capitalism 101, property rights. So the delay in having a global climate regime that we are on the merge of having by the end of 2015 when they're supposed to close was the time that was needed to do the climate structural adjustment, as we call it. They have reformed forest codes, mining codes, environmental legislation all over the world to introduce this new concept, which is carbon rights. How can you have the property of private property of carbon if you don't own the land? Because we are now on a moment where the system and the privatization that the system entails because it needs to privatize and then commodify to then trade it around, it has got to the edges of the planet. So now you need to build different layers. You have to commodify the intangibles. I'm not saying nothing new. This was embedded in 1995, Marrakesh Agreements, intellectual property rights, the trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights, which were the basis of the creation of WTO. No? I'm saying this because WTO is completing 20 years next year. There will be a big celebration. Brazil is, has the director general of WTO, and they are committed to close the Doha round. No? That's danger. So back to creation, creating carbon rights. I, I'm, I, I would like to know who thinks about that when we evoke the idea of climate change. Anyone? Okay. So Marx, good old Marx, Capital, Volume 1, Chapter 24, talks about, tell us, no, tell us, the story of how the primitive accumulation happened in England. How over 300 years they enclosure the commons and they transformed land into private property. And he says it was amazing to see the stoic um, attitude of those who have watched this process for 300 years. So we don't have 300 years. We have been watching this over the last 10 years or so. And this is a condition, a sine qua non condition to what is coming our way. Next year, with the 20th anniversary of WTO, with the 70th anniversary of the UN system, and with the launching of the post-1215 development agenda, we will have a new moment 
in our struggles where the trade that we have been fighting since 1999 in the Battle of Seattle. I don't know who were here. But after that, we had the World Social Forum processes. I'm from Porto Alegre, where the, the, the forum began. You know? And we had all this debate about, you know, um, um, the world is not for sale. The world is not a commodity. Another world is possible. And the process went on, but at the, at the same time that was trying to reorganize a discourse for the left, it failed into its intrinsic processes. And then it come the climate agenda. That was not new because the problem was old. But it was very interesting to feed that from on. Then we had the launching of the Stern report to make the economic case of climate change. Then we had the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity, another international metric. And so we are moving forward, maybe without the time to reflect how far we are being utile for the hegemonic discourse and for the hegemonic structures. Because if you look of the draft of the negotiation and the papers right now, it's horrible. It's infested by the word net. Net is a code for compensation. When I talk about net deforestation, it's because it's not gross deforestation. It's because net, because I will create a mechanism to compensate elsewhere. And this, through the climate regime, we will allow an international trade of those units, the so-called carbon emission reduction units, but actually what they will allow on the ground, remember, as above, so below, is that we can define which territories we want to open up for fracking, which one we are going to enter to get lithium, to get the other coltrum that we, we are doing mining on the bed, on the seabed. Now, this was a big debate now in, in Korea in the Convention of Biological Diversity. So, I mean, I could go on, on, and on, but my time has stopped. So, just to conclude for now, I would say that for me, the ILL, IAL, sorry, uh, we should really think strong, uh, think truly what commonism could be. Because the commons that were enclosure and taken from us is not a thing. They are a process. They only exist when there is social process creating it and recreating it on a daily basis. And in this sense, uh, somebody spoke about in this morning about land reform. I've worked many years with land reform and I still believe in that land reform is a fundamental issue that is the space we have to build this another world that we believe in possible and we, that we will have to restore the ecosystem and to rebuild the alliance. So just to finish with Via Campesina, because I think it's the motto of the peasants and farmers world movement, globalize the struggle, globalize the hope. Thank you.